Hi, it's a pleasure to join you for the 15th International BHL Medical Research Symposium. I'm going to discuss the management of VHL associated pheochromocytoma and pancreatic lesions, including neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. I'm going to cover two main areas. What are the important considerations when managing VHL associated pheochromocytomas? and pancreatic lesions. Second, I'll go over approaches that is precise surgical intervention for VHL-associated pheochromocytoma and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor supported by data for this approach. As many of you know, pheochromocytomas and pancreatic lesions are quite common in patients with VHL. Pheochromocytomas in most patients with VHL are diagnosed on surveillance or screening. Patients can present with symptoms, and in which case they're often the first member of the family to be diagnosed with VHL. Depending on the studies being follow-up or natural history studies or cross-sectional studies, the rate or prevalence of pheochromocytoma in patients with VHL is anywhere from 18 to 30 percent, a higher prevalence, obviously, if it's a natural history study. Pheochromocytoma should be diagnosed by biochemical testing. Plasma-free fractionated measurements of normetanephrine and metanephrine are most accurate. However, 24-hour urinary norometanephrine and metanephrine level measurement has a significant role in the pediatric population who don't necessarily need to have phlebotomies done every year. Once we have the biochemical diagnosis, imaging is important. Anatomic imaging in this patient population usually includes an MRI of the abdomen, as you could see in the image, pheochromocytomas on T2-weighted images have high intensity, the left adrenal tumor consistent with a pheochromocytoma. Paragangliomas can also occur in patients, head and neck, chest, as well as abdominal paraganglioma in patients with VHL. Here on MRI is an example of a paraganglioma encircling the renal vein and artery. On CT scan, pheochromocytomas usually have a high Hounsfield unit, both on non-contrast and contrast CT. They're often heterogeneous and might even have a necrotic central area, as you could see in the CT scan here. Nuclear medicine also has an important role in the evaluation of VHL-associated pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma. The principal reason to do a nuclear medicine study in this patient population is to detect another primary tumor site that was not detected on anatomic imaging, or the rare instances a patient might have a metastatic, that is malignant, pheochromocytoma to detect sites of metastasis. This could be an FDG PET, dotatate PET, F-DOPA or F-DOPAMINE. The detection rate for FDG-PET and specifically for dotatate is much higher for neuroendocrine tumors in general, but also specifically for pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. This is an important imaging study in the evaluation of patients with VHL-associated pheochromocytoma. Well, most practice guidelines recommend biochemical screening every one year for pheochromocytoma in patients with VHL. However, there's really limited data on the optimal age to initiate screening. And then other two areas that I'll cover is, what do you do when there's a lesion? But biochemical testing is normal, and I mean a lesion in the adrenal gland. And then do you remove the whole adrenal gland or do you do cortical sparing 
or partial adrenalectomy. As you can see in this image, patients with VHL-associated pheochromocytoma could have multiple nodules or tumors in their adrenal gland. This is a patient that had the right adrenal gland removed that could not have cortical sparing adrenalectomy. And you could see there superior, mid, inferior pole pheochromocytomas in the right adrenal gland. First question is, when should we start screening? This is a study that we did eight years ago in a cohort of 273 patients diagnosed with VHL. 31% of them had a diagnosis of pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. Specifically for paraganglioma, these were three cases. One had a neck paraganglioma and two abdominal paragangliomas. No surprise, the mean age of diagnosis was younger, which is typical in an inherited disease. And the earliest onset of pheochromocytoma was in a young boy that was five and a half years. When you look at specifically the prevalence in those that were 10 years and younger, we found that 7% of the patients were diagnosed before the day age of 10. Emphasizing the importance that screening and surveillance should start at five years of age and should be done annually. What about the clinical scenario, or if you will, the clinical dilemma where patients undergoing imaging for other sites of tumor, specifically the kidneys, and an adrenal mass is detected, but their biochemical testing is negative. A good rule of thumb is often the pheochromocytomas need to be two centimeter or larger to be functional. This is a nice study done by Sanford and colleagues where they chose active surveillance in patients that had lesions that were small. They found that the growth rate in this cohort was heterogeneous. And in fact, there was in some patients, it took up to 10 years, a lesion that was a centimeter, a centimeter and a half, to be functional or to grow. This data suggests if biochemical testing is negative and the patient has a small adrenal lesion, that active surveillance would be very reasonable. Next question is cortical sparing adrenalectomy. Why should we consider doing this in this patient population? Well, they're at risk of developing pheochromocytoma in both adrenal gland and requiring resection of this. So saving as much cortical function to avoid adrenal insufficiency requiring steroid replacement or the long-term risk of developing adrenal Addisonian crisis is an important consideration. When we looked at this in the same cohort of patients, 14% of patients that had a partial or cortical sparing adrenalectomy developed recurrence in their remnant gland. And as you could see, this took nearly up to 10 years during follow-up for the recurrence to develop. The shortest interval that was observed for a recurrence was half a year to up to almost 40 years after partial adrenalectomy. The case of the recurrence within a half in a year was probably the fact that a patient had an existing tumor that probably should have been resected at the time of partial adrenalectomy. Four of the nine patient recurrences were in the pediatric population. But again, the time period to developing recurrence was quite broad and could have been as, well, as long as 19 years of age. Important point is none of the patients developed metastatic disease or, if you will, had malignant recurrence. And in fact, in my entire career, taking care of patients with VHL-associated pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, I've had only one patient who's a de novo mutation, 
first family member to be diagnosed with VHO who presented with an eight centimeter tumor that had metastatic pheochromocytoma. This is another recent study that nicely illustrates the point that adrenal sparing approach in children is a durable approach and does not subject them to high recurrence rates or developing metastatic disease. All these children had presented with bilateral pheochromocytoma. And as you could see in 25% develop recurrence, but you look at the time to recurrence it was four years and six years. So in many instances, the partial adrenalectomy is durable when looking at recurrence, but more importantly, it avoids the need for steroid replacement. So we went over what is the extent of adrenalectomy needed. A partial adrenalectomy is a reasonable approach in these patients. And a minimally invasive approach is the procedure of choice, which is associated with a shorter hospital stay, faster recovery time, and less pain. And this could be done with a lateral or retroperitoneal approach. I'm showing here in the lower panel a video of a retroperitoneal approach and here a lateral approach where a patient had a partial adrenalectomy. A partial adrenalectomy is easiest when the tumor is small. As I shared with you, the one case of an early recurrence, an intraoperative ultrasound should be performed to make sure you're not missing a tumor that should be resected at the time of partial adrenalectomy. And in our cohort, greater than 80% of the patients were steroid free. Our typical protocol for patients who undergo partial adrenalectomy is to do a cortitropin stimulation test two days after their operation to demonstrate they have adequate adrenal cortical reserve. Now I'm going to talk about VHL associated pancreatic lesions. Most common lesions, as you could see in the CT scan, which could be diffuse throughout the pancreas, are cystic lesions. These cystic lesions, unlike in the sporadic setting, have no malignant or metastatic potential. Serous cyst adenomas could occur in 6 to 8% of patients, and then 8 to 12% of patients could ha have a characteristic solid lesions that enhances an arterial phase that is most consistent with a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. Guidelines recommend imaging of the abdomen, specifically looking at the pancreas with MRI, with contrast is preferred. An ultrasound, a CT scan may be considered. And I'll share with you some data on what's the most optimal imaging studies in the context that patients with VHL would require a lifetime of imaging and consideration of the radiation exposure to patients. What about the cystic pancreatic lesions? These lesions are rarely symptomatic, are non-functional, and the significant issue in patients is that they can develop exocrine function loss. Here I have a cross-sectional image of a CT scan demonstrating diffuse replacement of the pancreas and enlarged cystic lesions. This patient was on pancreatic enzyme replacement, so it's really important when patients are in a surveillance program that we ask specific questions in regards to symptoms that may be related to exocrine pancreas dysfunction. Rarely, patients might develop local obstructive symptoms. Again, this CT scan demonstrates a biliary drain. This patient had obstruction of the common bile duct from cystic lesions in the pancreas and required a total pancreatectomy. This is a rare occurrence in most patients. How about the serous cyst adenomas? 
those two also have no malignant potential. However, they can masquerade as a solid pancreatic lesion that is concerning for a neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas. How do we distinguish it and not surgically intervene in these patients? And this is an analysis that we did after resecting a solid lesion and finding that it was a serous cyst adenoma. We found FDG PET scan could help distinguish between pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, which typically have a high SUV, and the serous microcystic adenomas, which do not. This is a way of stratifying patients of having a neuroendocrine tumor or a serocystic microcyst adenoma. An important feature and the reason for doing functional imaging studies, especially if surgical intervention is entertained. As I shared with you, the remaining pancreatic lesions could be neuroendocrine tumors. And the clinical dilemma in this scenario is, is the tumor functional? Well, in all the studies published, these neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas are non-functional. Do not secrete insulin, gastrin, somatostatin. So that's never a clinical issue in the evaluation of patients with VHL-associated pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. The more important question is, is the tumor malignant? Is there presence of metastatic disease? And what influences our management is the tumor grade, which is also associated with the metastatic or malignant potential, and the growth of the primary tumor. And one asks, then, what is the best way to detect metastasis in such cases? These lesions as I shared with you, have characteristic enhancement on the arterial phase. And this is a case of a patient that we saw had a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor that was a grade one on endoscopic biopsy in the Uncinet process. And the patient was recommended to have a Whipple resection at another institution. And I'll go over what we recommended this patient based on data that allows us to practice precision surgery, if you will, or precision medicine. We now have a fair amount of data in regards to VHL-associated pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, where the type of mutation, the location of the uh, uh, mutation, and the use of functional imaging allows us to be exact and accurate in the management of patients with VHL-associated pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. Or in layman's term, let the crime fit the punishment. The crime being is, what is the metastatic potential, or is it malignant? So what is the best way to detect the primary neuroendocrine tumors, as well as metastasis? Neuroendocrine tumors, fortunately, have many cell surface receptors that have been taken advantage of for radionucleotide imaging. This is a study we did in 87 patients that underwent annual surveillance with anatomic imaging as well as functional imaging. And 40 pa uh, patients had all four imaging modalities. When you look at the detection rate of these imaging modalities, specifically with detecting primary pancreatic solid lesions. CT scan detected the most number of lesions followed by MRI scan and FDG PET and F-DOPA. This data suggests, at least at the initial screening, that in a pancreatic protocol CT scan should be done to detect the presence of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. What's unique about VHL-associated pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors or other tumor sites is that there's upregulation in HIF that leads to angiogenesis and tumor progression. But more importantly, these tumors have high GLUT transporter expression levels that leads 
to FDG PET being taken up by these tumors. But as with other solid tumors, the uptake of this radioisotope could be heterogeneous with areas of necrosis not taking it up or more peripheral uptake. And from other studies of lung cancer and other solid cancers, it's been demonstrated that the SUV on FDG PET, the metabolic tumor volume measured on FDG PET, or the total lesion glycolysis could be associated with prognosis or the rate of tumor growth or response to tumor, uh, rather to treatment. What we did was institute this imaging modality in which 109 of 197 patients had a solid pancreatic lesion. And these patients had both CT scan and FDG PET, where 165 and 44 lesions were detected respectively. The most important part of the study was the FDG PET was able to detect metastatic disease that was not detected by CT scan. And as I mentioned, the serous microcyst adenomas in three patients representing a non neoplastic or non malignant lesion, a surgical intervention was avoided. The figure here shows the mean scatter plot SUV uptake in the primary tumor. And again, as you could see, neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas have much higher uptake. Well, we also could use standard of care, FDG PET, in calculating the total lesion glycolysis or the metabolic tumor volume. And as you can see in the scatter plot here, those that had non-metastatic lesion on average had lower values of total lesion glycolysis, <clears throat> demonstrating that this is in the primary tumor. It could also be useful for addressing the malignant potential in these primary tumors. There's also an important role for MRI, especially in patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors where surgical intervention is entertained. MRI EOVISTA could detect fairly small metastasis to the liver, as you could see here in a patient, a primary tumor of only eight millimeters had a high SEV uptake, and MRI EOVISTA shows a liver metastasis that's about five millimeter in size. In this case, the patient wouldn't necessarily have had surgical intervention and during surveillance, his metastasis could have been missed. And the reason to do MRI in these patients is functional imaging with Dota tape or FDG PET itself, since there's significant uptake in the liver, it's not good for evaluating liver metastasis. Another area where functional imaging specifically with Dota tape, which has the highest detection rate for neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas is, can we use this to replace anatomic imaging? Since we found CT scan for detecting primary pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors was high, but this is associated with significant radiation exposure during the lifetime surveillance in patients with BHL. The table here shows the estimated radiation dose. Interestingly, dotatate has the lowest radiation exposure to patients, lower than CT scan and FDG PET. So when we looked at the cohort of patients that prospectively had dotatate imaging and compared it to head-to-head -head with CT imaging, in the neck, in the chest, in the abdomen, you could see the detection rate was significantly higher for detecting both neuroendocrine tumors of the, uh, of the pancreas, as well as pheochromocytoma and pericanglioma, compared to CT scan imaging, and even more so than MRI, which obviously would not have 
radiation exposure. This suggests is specific to pheochromocytomas and neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas, dotatate imaging for sale valence perhaps would be the best imaging modality than anatomic imaging. How do we also better risk stratify the risk of metastatic disease in patients with VHL-associated pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors that's localized? Generally, resection is recommended for tumors that are three centimeters larger, again, because natural history studies demonstrated the rate of metastatic disease was high in these patients. Obviously, if the lesion is growing, one is more concerned that it might be malignant. Grade with endoscopic ultrasound biopsy is an important adjunct to this. And I hope I've convinced you using FDG PET, better yet, if dotatate imaging, if available at your institution, results <clears throat> in a more precise surgical intervention in these patients. What about the data on the type of mutation? This is a study that we did in a cohort of patients that were surveillance for solid pancreatic lesions consistent with neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas. What we found was the need for surgical intervention by mutation type and type of mutation and size, tumor size that were 1.2 to 3 centimeters, those that had a missensitization were more likely to require surgical intervention, as well as those patients that had a mutation in exon 3. When you integrate this information, if a patient didn't have a missense mutation or a mutation in exon 3, the likelihood that they would require surgical intervention was near nil. So this is important information, especially for tumors that are in the gray zone, if you will, two to three centimeters of whether to surgically intervene. The optimal extent of resection in patients with VHL-associated pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor in most cases should be enucleation with resection of the regional lymph nodes. And one could consider this a reasonable approach if they're low risk of having a malignant tumor based on the type of mutation and location of mutation in addition to the tumor size, the growth rate, and the grade of the tumor. Those who are high risk should have a formal pancreatectomy. Now, really, velzutifan, I think, is going to be a game changer in the management of patients with borderline or intermediate pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. I show a cross-sectional MRI. It's a patient with a tumor that was three centimeters that we were considering resection started on therapy for renal cell carcinoma. And you could see the tumor almost completely disappeared in the head of the pancreas. And this patient did not need surgical intervention for his pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. I'd like to finish off by emphasizing the impact or the importance of patients being a surveillance program that have VHL-associated pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. This is an analysis that we did, a cohort of 153 patients with VHL-associated pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors compared to patients that had neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas reported in the National Cancer Registry, the SEER database. No surprise, as you could see, the age of presentation was much younger in patients with VHL consistent with an inherited syndrome. What's interesting though, when you look at the disease-specific mortality in patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor with VHL compared to those in the SEER cohort, there was nearly no mortality observed. 
And they look at specifically those that required surgical intervention, as you could argue, the entire cohort might have had low risk of malignant tumors or metastatic tumors. 35 uh, uh, patients required surgical intervention compared to a little over 1,100 in the SEER cohort. Again, demonstrating surveillance allows early detection, early intervention, no disease-specific mortality in the VHO cohort compared to the SEER cohort. And I should emphasize this was matched for age, tumor size, and grade of tumor. This emphasizes the importance of patients being in a surveillance program. I'm going to finish up by emphasizing that screening and surveillance for patients with VHL-associated pheochromocytoma and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor is essential, and data is clearly demonstrated that reduces morbidity related to the intervention or the disease process itself, and this is also true for mortality. Patients with pheochromocytoma should have adrenal preserving adrenalectomy, especially if the lesion is localized and it's low risk for tumor. And most of these patients are off steroid replacement. Biochemically negative, but image positive, small pheochromocytomas could be safely observed. And that screening in families should start at the age of five. In regards to neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas or VHL associated pancreatic lesions, early detection is key. Accurate staging with functional imaging studies, notate if it's available at your institution or FDG PET and specifically paying attention to the type and location of mutation, the tumor size, and again, the functional imaging findings dictate the need and type of surgical intervention that's warranted. And one area in the future that really needs to be investigated is the use of somatostatin analogs in patients that might require surgical intervention to stabilize their disease, or the idea of using bolsitophan as treatment for these lesions that might require surgical intervention. Thank you again for the privilege to present at the 15th Research VHL Symposium.